Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Kelsey Derringer, and I am the Professional Development Coordinator for Bird Brain Technologies. So that means that I get to work with teachers all over the world to help them uh, learn and incorporate coding and robotics into their classrooms. Um, but I'm not here by myself, as always. I'm joined by our director and producer, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hey, Kelsey. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to answer some of the questions that will be coming in from Facebook. That's right. So we are going live on Facebook right now. And I don't know why this feels extra silly during teacher talks when we have our little <laughs> Matt the Robot. But I like Matt the Robot. Matt is... Uh, Matt is actually a small car cardboard person. Um, <laughs> just kidding. He's a regular human-sized person. But um, he is monitoring our video that is live on Facebook. So if you're watching us, you can comment live on that Facebook video, and we'll see it, and we'll bring that into our discussion today, which I'm really excited about because it's not just me and Matt on this discussion today. We have a whole host of teachers. Do you guys all want to wave hello? Hello. <laughs> um, teachers who are here to talk about what it's like to program and code and build with hummingbirds. Um, and so just before we went live, we were having a really great discussion about what it's like to program in make code as your programming language. And Caroline, do you want to share what you were talking about? Just maybe tell us like the students that you teach and then the things that you really enjoy about make code and then one of the challenges you found as well. Do you want to share that? Sure. Um, I am an elementary school teacher. I teach at an all-girls elementary school in San Francisco. I have scheduled coding classes with girls in grades two through eight. Um, I've been using the Hummingbird with my seventh graders and started using Make Code this past year with both the Hummingbird and the Microbit. Um, the problem that we ran into was that the um, because you don't create an account and save your, your code to your account, um, we, had problem, we had problems with sharing devices and losing projects. Um, it is a super easy uh, interface to use. It's color coded, it's blocks, it's JavaScript, it's everything that you want it to be. But um, teaching the kids how to download their hex files and save them somewhere, whether it's on a, a shared Google Dra uh, Doc or in Drive, um, is a super important skill to teach them early on so they don't lose their projects. Yeah, on, on that note, um, why don't I take a second here and just show everybody how that works. Um, so here I have Microbit Classroom open, which is a version of MakeCode here. And um, so the way to, um, actually I'll just go to MakeCode to show you how to save and share because it works a little differently. So if I go to makecode.microbit.org, hey, here's a, the leftovers of a project that we were working on recently. So the way to um, save and share code um, uh, I totally agree, Caroline, that this is a great thing to cover early on because something that teachers really like about MakeCode is there's no usernames and passwords to keep track of for students. Hallelujah, one less spreadsheet, one less thing that they've... I didn't bring my journal to class and I have it written in the back of my journal. Oh, thank goodness that we don't need that. But how do students pick up where they left off the day before, especially like your students were, Caroline, when they're sharing devices in between class periods? Well, here's how you share and save code. You can um, give it a, a, a name down there. We were playing with music in Make Code, so this is um, Beats Test 2, because we were working on some beats, fun things that we do in our free time. Um, but the way to share code, you use this little three dots up here, and then you, it says you need to publish your project to share it or embed it in another web page. Um, you acknowledge having consent to publish this project. Sure, we're going to publish it. And when you do that, you get this um, hyperlink here. So I could copy that, and I could go to, say, my email, and I could send this to myself, kelsey at birdbraintechnologies.com. I could call this, I like calling it what it is, beats program. And then I could paste it in there and send it to myself. So you could email it to yourself. You could also start a collaborative Google Doc. Either um, you could have the students save it for themselves in a Google Doc if they have Drive. You could create a Google Doc that is for each class period, let's say. That way the students can communicate with each other. Um, I really like that method. When I do professional development, when I go places, if I ever get to go places again, um, I create Google Docs um, for um, teachers who are in the PD to share code with each other and share resources. So that's a great way, too. And yeah, Alicia, go for it. Oh, 
uh, am I moving? Oh, I had a quick question. So if you're a one-to-one Chromebook school and kids are doing this for a project and it says you need to give the consent to publish, is that something you have to worry about as far as IT permissions or has anyone had that issue or navigated that? Nope. Uh, that is one of the main reasons why I love uh, Make Code so much, is that it works perfectly on Chromebooks, which is great because so, uh, so many schools have moved. If they are one-to-one, -one, they're probably one-to-one -one with Chromebooks. Um, so Make Code works perfectly on laptops and Chromebooks. And I, so far, have not, found, uh, have not run into a permission um, a firewall or anything with IT departments. So uh, they're allowed to get on Make Code. It works just great. Saving code is uh, works just fine, and because it creates a hyperlink, um, it, it makes it really easy to share and save that. But yeah, Matt, it looks like we have a question maybe coming in from Facebook as well. What's up? Well, not a question, but as so much as a comment. There is another way to save your projects in Make Code if you were to download that hex file directly. That's true. Uh, then that could be saved to a document. It sounds like that might have been what Caroline was doing. Yeah. So um, if you're uh, another way to do it is if you're in. Um, make code here, you could also hit this save button and that would download a hex file and you could save that file wherever you wanted to and then you could um, go back and open that up and that would take you back to make code so you could do that as well. I tend to use the totally online version because I tend to lose files when I save them on my computer <laughs> but <laughs> if, you've, if you've got a good place to save things, if you've got a nice box, a pretty little box somewhere on your drive that you can <laughs> save it, that works too. Yeah, Nick. What's up, uh, Nick? The first one is when you do the share, right? You do the share and uh, you, you get the link. Is the file saved at that point somewhere? Um, it, it, can, it can be. There's, um, so if I were to go to, I'll, I'll cancel that. Because um, you have a link. The link to what? No. Uh, so that link, uh, if I shut this down um, and then I, if I copied that link, if I opened that link back up, it takes me to something that looks like this. So this is like a preview of the file. And then I can go in and click edit. And that just opens the project back up wherever I left it off so, at. So, it, so it's, it's automatically saved and when you do share link. Okay. Yep. That, and each time you create a hyperlink like that, it's basically like saving different versions of a Word doc. Um, <laughs> so when you, if I, if I had gone, if I update this code right now, if I change stuff about it, it doesn't matter. This hyperlink will take me back to whatever version I sent myself. Um, so um, I really like that for sending students example code as well. You can make a hyperlink like this. You can then make a little like bit.ly link of that, a shortened URL of it. Um, and um, you can send students like, here's your starter code, go be free. And each group can make their own code and it won't edit the original code. And then they save theirs and submit that back to you or share that with each other. I, I, like, I really like how, how make code saves files like that. Yeah. Um, Deepika. Right, so when it's, when it's oh, sorry, when, go ahead. When, after you've done that and you've edited it, then um, you have to get another link if you want the new version, right? Yep. Exactly. You okay. just would save a new version and we have a new hyperlink. Yep. I see. Yeah. Okay. That's good. All right. That's what I wanted to know. Thanks. So just to update folks who are just tuning in, um, we're talking about programming your Hummingbird bit using make code. We're going to kind of talk about programming using some different languages today and see a little bit of what that's like and get teachers' experiences with that. And then we're also going to talk about joy and joy in um, being creative with computer science and robotics. So that's coming up a little bit later. But um, Deepika, it uh, looks like you had a, a question or comment as well. What's up? Yes, yes. So the one that you uh, showed, Karen, like right now, this mm -hmm. is like a per student basis, right? This is not a classroom that you were using uh, to teach the students, right? So this is something right. different than the classroom, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK. So in the classroom, have you ever had a problem? Like I just started teaching a micro bit and hummingbird online. Uh, so I usually create a classroom and share uh, the, you know, the classroom name and the pin code sure. with the students. But most of the time they were having difficulty connecting to the classroom. Like it tries to log in and then it says, oof, some, something went wrong. Have you ever faced that issue? You know, I haven't. We've had a lot of success with Microbit Classroom. Just to let people know, and um, will you say your name for me so that I can say it correctly? Deepika. Deepika. Thank you, Deepika. Um, so in Microbit Classroom, which is um, this right here, 
Microbit Classroom is super easy to set up. In fact, I will close this one down um, really quick so that uh, you can see what it's like. So I'm just going to Google Microbit Classroom. Google knows what I like. It's going to open that back up. And so I can make a new activity. I could call this um, test activity. I say I want to do it in make code. I launch the classroom, and that's how easy it is to set up. Um, to get people to join, you go to this little dashboard here, and it gives you the information for your students to join. So they go to this URL here, they, uh, and it prompts them, and I can do that right now as well. Um, it prompts them to join, so we would enter in that information, silver, bear, fire engine, piano, like so. And so, were your students able to get this far, Dipika? Yes. And then, okay. when they entered the PIN code, so a couple of times they were able to uh, log in, and I could see their code when they were changing, but uh, most of the time they are just not able to, you know, get to the classroom. Yeah, yeah, once you enter the PIN number, it keeps, like, tr it tries to log in when you say continue, and after a while, it just gives up. It says, oops, something went wrong. Hmm. Okay, so this is where it was breaking down for you guys. Yes, yeah. Okay, hmm. interesting. Yeah, um, Matt, do you have something yeah. to offer on there? Uh, I do, actually. I mean, with, uh, with Microbit Classroom, there are, it feels very weird to be making this comment through a robot, but <laughs> you're, you're all, you all understand. Uh, with Microbit Classroom, um, there is essentially, I think, six different fail points, right, with the, with the five different login credentials and then the pin. And I would say that 90% of the problems that we've had with people logging on, it's just them misentering one of those logins. I can't say for sure if that's the problem that you're experiencing, but um, I, for just to give you an idea, about 90% of the problems that we've had have come from that. Yeah, they put in, uh, you know, the, like the color was purple and they didn't realize that you have to scroll down to find purple. So they were just like, yeah, indigo is like purple, kind of, but not quite. <laughs> Doesn't count. <laughs> um, so they were just entering in the wrong, the wrong thing. Um, but just to, to finish out like what Microbit Classroom is versus Make Code, so Microbit Classroom, I'll finish joining here. I will be Kelsey, the student. There we go. Um, so Microbit Classroom allows you to, I can see my student code here. Now there's only one student signed into this classroom here. But I could see, let's say I'll go back to my student thing, and I will say forever, let's show these LEDs. Bloop, bloop. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Cool. Now I could go back here and I could see what Kelsey the student is working on. So I as the teacher can see what all of my students are doing and it makes collaborating really, really easy. And also there is an opportunity where once more students had joined, I could share something that a student had made. I could share that with all the rest of the students. Um, you can also go build code for yourself as a teacher in the editor portion and then you could share code with the students that way too. Um, so what we do usually is we will create a couple different students because we usually like to share a couple different codes and we like to have them pre-made before the class starts so that it's real snappy. And so we just pre-make some student accounts. So there's like Kelsey the student one and Kelsey the student two and Kelsey the student three. Um, and then um, we can share those codes with the rest of the students in the class. And they're still using make code. Like the, the interface is, is the same. It's all those same blocks. They can still switch over and see it in JavaScript. And that JavaScript is still color coded in a way that's really useful. Um, they've still got the simulator here so that they can see what their code is going to do on a microbit before they download it. If they have a microbit with them, they could go ahead and download it onto their microbit. Or we could share their code with us with our student account and we could download that their code onto our robot and in fact um, on yesterday's webinar I will keep this muted on yesterday's webinar we were talking about this parade float challenge and students were coding and recoding our parade float here and so we we did that we had three different student codes that we had preloaded something that they could change about this and then we sent it out they edited it and then we would um, put their code back on this robot. Um, so if you're looking for good examples of 
Well, I won't say good. If you're looking, ah, I will. If you're looking for good examples of how to use Microbit Classroom, watch some of our student-facing webinars. If I can toot toot our horn. <laughs> yeah. We'll, uh, we'll share that Facebook, uh, the link to that video. We'll share that in the chat for Zoom. But also, if you are watching us live on Facebook, then you already know where to find our videos. They're on the Bird Brain Facebook page. Um, so you can go and you can find all of our past webinars there. And we also upload them to YouTube, although that's a little bit after the fact because we have to uh, do a little finagling. Um, so uh, the videos are usually up on Facebook within a week or so um, as well. So, um, yeah, Nick. Uh, just for clarification, uh, would I be right in thinking that it's actually two robots, not one? Yes, the, this robot that we made yesterday, and I'll, I'll demo this for everybody so you can see it. Um, this robot is actually two robots, not one, because the top, this is a parade float, this is what we made yesterday. The top is a playground, and this is still running some students' code from yesterday, so they decided one of the kids was really heavy on the, <laughs> on the seesaw, <laughs> which made all of us laugh. <laughs> And they also made this go pretty fast, so I'm pretty sure those kids would be flung about the playground at this point. But that one, uh, that, that robot is running the top of our parade float, but we made it detachable so that we could also run the bottom of our parade float. So our, the bottom of our parade float brought to you by... <laughs> I keep saying we should get a sponsorship out of this, but... Say lovey. Um, on the bottom, it's got a couple motors, it's got a ping pong ball. And then this guy is actually a line following rover. And I think, if I remember correctly, this still has the wrong code on it from yesterday. So, do you guys want to see what this code does? <laughs> or did you re redo it, Matt? No, no, I did not. Okay. So, we were, we were encouraging the students, we sent them code that works that made this into a line following robot. And we encouraged them to change numbers in the code to break it. And they did, and this is what they did. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> there we go. No longer a line following rover. Uh, it's very acrobatic, very ice capades. But, <laughs> but this, this student that had made this code did something that I think we both expected, which was set everything to 100. Yep. <laughs> which is something <laughs> kids just want to do. It and was the most 12-year-old response <laughs> to a robot. Put it all, right. all at 100%. Yes, sir. Let's see what happens when we put it all and at 100%. And he made some hypotheses as, as to what would happen. He was uh, like, it'll go really fast. And I was like, let's find out, right? <laughs> it was great. It did around. But very fast. Just went very fast. Went going nowhere real fast, as they say. <laughs> Um, but if we go back to that um, bird brain webinar really quick, I just want to show you um, what it looked like when it was actually following a line. We'll scooch it. Where was it? Ah, there it is. So this is what it looked like when it was actually following the line here. Oops. Um, so we've got an LED and a light sensor pointed downward and then it's sensing when it's going over some black electrical tape and when it's going over some white paper. And so that's what's happening right here. We've got an LED and a light sensor, and we've got a little uh, bottle cap spacer so that it's pointed, it's really close to the ground there, so the LED is shining downwards. You could see the green light on it. And then the, um, it was inching forward following that black line. So definitely check out yesterday's webinar if you want to learn more about how that system works and see I think we did maybe two or three different kids trying to break this code and one of, some of them made some changes that didn't break the code which was super informative that didn't break the robot and some of them made some changes that did break the robot and break the robot meaning like it didn't follow a line anymore or it didn't move anymore and it was really informative I, I had never done something quite like that before of giving give them something that works and then encourage them to change one thing and see how it breaks that was I think a really cool teaching method um, so if you ever get a chance to do that that was a fun way to teach it um, uh, let's continue our discussion about um, programming languages though does anyone have any other questions or comments that you guys want to make or offer about make code as a programming language and the, or about other programming language languages um, yeah Nick yeah um, the question is in the transition 
between the make code and in this case it would be Java or some other programming language which is text based on how you deal with the um, the transition from event based to sequential operations. Ah, um, I, I, I know you tried that you, by by putting the forever loop and go, having them go through the operations sequentially in that, and that was mm -hmm. one way to do it. Um, but um, maybe you can comment. No, yeah, I, I, I was just about to say, like, um, transition, helping students transition from block-based to text-based is not something that I personally have much expertise in because I primarily teach in block-based coding. So yeah. I'll pose that to the group. Um, I know some of you work with students from block-based through text-based. How do you guys support your students to go from, so, like, something you can do in block-based coding is you can have multiple forever loops, and you can just kind of arrange them however you want around the screen, manipulate them a little bit, um, and students can have multiple forever loops. But when you go to text-based, you've, you've, you've got to arrange things a little differently. So in the webinar yesterday, what we did was uh, the first code I shared with them had multiple forever loops. Each forever loop controlled one component on our robot. And then the second code that I shared with them had one forever loop where the, all of the components were in there sequentially, so they were kind of learning how that works a little bit. What other tips, tricks, or ideas do you guys have for helping students transition from block-based coding to text-based coding? And that's for you folks on Facebook, too. Do you have anything, Eileen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you would. I do know for AP Computer Science Principles, they teach pseudocode, so it's not language-specific, but they do have a text-based component alongside a block-based component for the pseudocode. Um, sort of covering all languages, so, um, you know, which is a good skill to have. So you can differentiate between both, be able to code in both, but it does, it does cover both sets. So can you tell us what pseudocode is? What, what do you mean when you say that? Okay, well, the exact definition, no, <laughs> the exact <laughs> you'll have to look it up, but it's basically, it is, um, it's not fake code if you take apart the words. Um, it's more a representation to try to cover multiple programming um, languages. Just kind of say, well, this is our planning code or our, you know, practice code because this is definitely what we want to accomplish. Okay, so it's sort of a an intermediary step between block-based and text-based. Um, yeah, somewhat, yeah. So it kind of covers both, and I see Nick's raising his hand, so he's got yeah, yeah, a better I, definition. <laughs> it, I, don't, I don't teach with the, um, the, the bit, micro bit, and I don't use Java, but um, the one I do use, I, I use Tinkercad circuits, and mm -hmm. they have um, Arduino Unos in there, and they have block code there, but it's not event-based block code, it's, it's sequential block code. Mm -hmm. But in that, um, it has the facility to translate the block code into the C++ code that you find in the regular Arduino interface. And mm -hmm. so you can say, put the things in there and then you push the button and you can see side by side the, the C++ code and the uh, other code. And, and you, you can run some comparisons down through that. Uh, you can see, for example, when you, um, in the block, you can make a variable and then you can go to the other code and say, look, this is where it declares the variable. Um, and then, oh, in the blocks, you don't have to set anything up, but look, how do they deal with this? And you can go into the Arduino code and say, look, here's what they had to do to set up a pin as an output or an input, for instance, this kind of thing. I, I really then, like that as a, as, a, as a starting point and as a development point for mm -hmm. it. You're, you're saying like build it in block-based coding yeah, and then yeah. build it in text-based coding and then go find it. Like you, well, you, you, you look at the block-based coding and understand what's doing what and then go find that in the text-based coding because yeah, yeah. you can see how it works. You can see how it works, right. I mean, th this, is not, um, this is not as advanced as some of the uh, probably th things that the... the that the, uh, the other people get into with the, um, the pseudocode and everything. Um, but it's basically what they're doing is taking the, um, the examples that come in the Arduino interface. So when you load the, the thing down off the Arduino website, you get a whole bunch of examples, code examples with it, which are in C++. They take those and they implement those in blocks and do the translation, you can see that. But if you build your own block stuff, it does translate it, and then you can download it and whatever. Anyway, 
that's enough about the Arduino stuff. So, Actually, uh, on that note, Matt has pulled a couple things up. Do you want to talk us through what we're looking at here, Matt? Sure, Nick. I'm not sure if this is what you use. Is this ArduBlock? Is that? No, no. Oh, no, it's not what you're using. I use, oh. I use Tinkercad. Tinkercad. Ah, Tinkercad. My, uh, my apologies. No. Uh, Arduino actually does have a, a plugin called ArduBlock. So for those of you, and this is not going to be relevant to any Hummingbird Bit users, but this might be relevant to you Hummingbird Duo users out there, because the Hummingbird Duo is based on yeah. the uh, Arduino Duo. Um, you can pull out uh, blocks, create this uh, this block-based code. We'll go ahead and just pull out a couple blocks. And then uh, I believe I could upload this to Arduino. There it is. So now I've uploaded it to my Arduino. And you can see that it shows up here as, a, as Arduino code. Um, so I can, uh, ha unfortunately, it doesn't go from Arduino back to the block based. But it's fantastic because now um, you know, I could set my LED. Oh, I don't want it at 255, which is its full potential brightness. I only want it at 100. So uh, uh, kids could start making. Um, uh, changes in the text base here and uh, and get a feel with it without having to worry about the syntax of, of C++ or Arduino in this case. So And, and just to, um, to kind of uh, confirm what Matt was saying too, uh, there's an older version. The, the version that we have out now and that we recommend is this Hummingbird bit right now. This is a, a beta version so it's a little well it doesn't it's not as fancy. There's some gray stuff on it. Yours is better. Um, but uh, so this one is the newest version of Hummingbird. It does a little bit more. It's a little bit cheaper. It's better packaged. It has better learning support materials go, that go with it. So if you've never gotten a Hummingbird before, you definitely want to go with the Hummingbird bit, which is the new one. This is the old version of the Hummingbird. So And, and this one is built around the micro bit as the microcontroller, the brains of the operation. The older version of Hummingbird is the Hummingbird Duo, which is this one. And part of the reason it's called du Duo is because it's built around Arduino. Um, so uh, this, uh, the older version, has the ability to be coded with Arduino or ArduBlock or whatever. Um, and then the Hummingbird is built around that. So that you've got your lights, your motors, your sensors, things like that. Um, but the, what Matt was just talking about with Arduino and ArduBlock works with this older version of Hummingbird not with the new one, because the new one doesn't have an Arduino in it. If Arduino and um, Ar or ArduBlock are really important to your computer science curriculum and you're looking for kind of a breakout board for that, we still sell duos. We still sell them in kits. We still support people who have them. Um, uh, so you can absolutely do that. You could also look at the microbit as a different microcontroller to use in your classroom. It's a really versatile tool as well. Um, the it does you know text-based. I think the block-based languages that go with that the, that go with the microbit are a little friendlier. Um, but just to confirm, old Hummingbird Duo works with Arduino. New Hummingbird bit doesn't work with Arduino, but has a microbit and so it has different capabilities. So just to clarify that thing about languages for users. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably, what other, oh, go ahead, Nick. I was going to say that probably your, your Java may be a little easier than the C++ when you get into it as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Eileen. I have a question that came up when I'm looking at the kit. Um, I have like really bright students and they like taking things like my Raspberry Pis and turning them into major hacking machines that bypass the firewall. So just verifying the new Hummingbird kits that I got with the micro bit, you can't turn them into hacking machines, right? Hacking machines seems like a really broad category, and I don't want to dissuade any learners, but like, I don't think so. It, yeah, it, <laughs> it, it does not have the ability to connect to the internet on its no. own. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they 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 can create a robot army to take over the world. So you know, keep an eye on them. But uh, they they the hummingbird does not communicate with the internet directly. Make code is a, is an online language um, and communicates to the hummingbird, but the hummingbird doesn't send information back to the internet. Um, so it's not it it can't it doesn't quite work like that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. At, at this um, time. At, at this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stay tuned. Terror. People on the internet who've hacked into it in some way. 
not not yours, but have hacked into the micro bit and used it for different things. And um, there is a way to, um, if you're using Snap, Snap is an online programming language. So Snap does have an active connection, um, whether it's Bluetooth or um, USB connection. Snap has an active connection to from the Hummingbird back to Snap. So like you can press the A button on your micro bit and something could happen in the Snap viewing window. So don't show your students this part of the webinar because if they wanted to do something, that's that's what I'd use if I were gonna, <laughs> if I were gonna, gonna make the hummingbird gonna, control gonna, the world. I think Sorry, we need Eileen. Tom here to make the. Uh, I know <laughs> we, we should bring Tom in. Tom could have some really great ideas about how to control the world. <laughs> Tom, La Dr. Tom Lauer is the very kind-hearted and brilliant founder of Bird Brain Technologies, who would never do anything like that. <laughs> uh, he's not here to defend himself, so. Um, but uh, what other questions do you guys have about using different languages with the Hummingbird um, as far as devices, uh, like using it with iPads, or are you guys curious about how it works with Snap? Um, anything like that? Yeah, I did see that you could use um, Python, which I, I, I didn't know that you could uh, program in Python as well, which our school does some computer science classes in that. But my school has had trouble um, using the embed feature. I'll try to embed the code like you did a share feature earlier. And I've had trouble working with and navigating embedding my code on the black button. Like I want to put just a little section of code on my class page so they see this, use that as a base and explore it. Um, maybe if that's something we have time later, you guys can help me navigate. Or if anybody else has had issues with Embedding code on Blackboard. Yeah, I'll um, I'll I'll uh, ask about that embedding code in just a moment. But but let me show folks what um, Alicia is talking about. And do you go? Do you like Alicia or Alicia? I want to make sure I'm saying your name correctly too. Thank you. It's actually Alicia. It was a social Alicia. experiment. Mom spelled it that way and pronounced it all right well I, I appreciate it Alicia I'm glad I, I'm glad I asked for clarification um, so on our website you can see all the different things that hummingbirds and finches work with if you go to get started um, you can click on hummingbird bit that's what you've got you can click on the device that you have available so I'm for example on a Windows and then it'll tell you which programming languages work with that device but you don't actually have to start there you could work backwards too you could say all right well I've got Chromebooks. Uh, hey, Finch and Hummingbird and Duo all work with Chromebooks. Cool, cool. Well, now what do I have? Okay, you can use Make Code or Snap. Or you could even go the other way around all entirely. You could say, listen, I want to use um, Python. What works with Python? Okay, I'm going to either need to have a Windows, Mac, or Linux machine. And hey, all these work with that too. So, okay, Hummingbird bit. Okay, if I want to use Hummingbird bit and Python, I've got to use a Windows or a Mac machine. Um, and then once you do that, it'll show you all of those combinations. I think it's so helpful um, to know what you've got and what that can work with. Um, and um, also, it'll remember your selections. So if you come back to this page again and you're like, why is something grayed out? It's probably remembered what you picked last time. You'll just like deselect that and then select whatever you want. At the bottom there, you go to get started and then it'll open up all the res it'll filter out all the resources that go with that other stuff and it'll just give you the things that you need to install program here's your Python library and then the build teach and resources those are just about the same for um, all of the different hummingbird languages but it'll give you just the information you need so here's how to install Python and we've got you know here's the bluebird connector here's you know comes with pictures instructions all that jazz when you're ready to um, get your library, here's the Python library, um, things like that. Uh, you can even print out these resources. Um, so going to that get started button and then just kind of clicking around with the options you've got or the options that you're interested in, that will help you filter out all the information you don't need because like what's really cool is like does Hummingbird work with blank? Like the answer is usually like yeah. That means like there's a lot of information about this and you shouldn't have to wade through all of it. So that, that whole page is designed to help you wade through all that information. But as far as Alicia's um, 
two, two things. Does anybody have questions about that getting started page or about figuring out which languages work with which device and which robot? Any questions about that? Um, well, then to Alicia's question, um, you, were, you were asking about um, embedding Python code in a website. Is that right? Or even embedding the, the block coding, the graphical programming, because I, know, it, I noticed it as an option with the share, and I tried to embed a base code on my class page that the students could see. But for some reason, I could embed it, but it would just show up as a white screen on my Blackboard uh, class page. You know, I, uh, I I have never tried that part of the um, I've never tried that part of it before. Um, but uh, what Alicia was talking about is when you go to um, share and publish, you can also like embed this in something. I've totally never tried that. So you're saying like it's been a little bit difficult. But the goal that you were talking about was to take this code. Um, and embed this code somewhere in a website or something that you were building for your students to access, right? Or just a picture so they see, okay, so this is the base code that my instructor wants us to start with today, and then I'll build from there. And sure. I mean, I'm, I'm navigating it. I did screenshots for them instead, but I was just wondering if anybody had used the embed feature, and if so, how how they use it or all of devices or programs. That is a, that how to use that embed feature is an awesome question to which I do not know the answer because my suggestion was going to be <laughs> screenshots. So, <laughs> you, that's you what I did. Thought of, so. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, well, we've got about 10 minutes left in our, our call here. And um, I wanted to um, talk about our, our title of today's webinar is sort of uh, Julia Child inspired, which is like the joy of teaching creative robotics. And um, the reason I was really excited about... Is that about really your best Julia Child is, impression? Uh, that's I'm not sorry. my best Julia Child, <laughs> but my best one is like too good, man. Like I'm the joy of teaching creative robotics. You asked for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen. Uh, okay. So, um, but the, the joy of teaching creative robotics, because that's actually when I work with teachers and when I have, when I get to do professional development with them, I ask them at the end of the day, what's really going to stick with you today? And by far and away, the, the thing that I hear most teachers say is, I thought this was going to be hard. And it's not that, it's, that it was easy, it's that it was fun. That like they themselves experience immense amounts of joy doing creative robotics and that they're so excited to bring something that is both challenging and fun into the classroom. So my question for, for us to discuss and what I'd love to hear from you guys is um, your experience of teaching Hummingbird and the joy that your students find in it. Is, is joy something that's either like it's either fun or it's hard? Can it be both? How do you, how do you see your students experiencing joy when they build things with Hummingbird. My uh, life yeah. is like it's a really forgiving process, you know, um, when they're in the prototyping phase and then they find a fly in a robot, they go back and fix it. And I think that forgiving nature and that quick turnaround, um, that really sticks with them. Yeah, so they're able to iterate and like make a thing and then make it over again and make it over again. And so they're not stuck with a bad decision. They get, that's part of the joy for them. That's a really cool observation. Yeah. What about you, Caroline? Um, my students absolutely love the making part of this. Um, I've done the bee waggle challenge a few times and I've done the mechanisms. So they I give them a box and then they choose a mechanism and then they build the mechanism and add a sensor to make the chain reaction. Mm. And I've had students that just say that that's having the glue guns out and the pipe cleaners and the styrofoam balls and having a music playlist on in the background, just being able to sit and make and then make things move um, has been super exciting for them. And, and, and what I hear too is like you're, you're giving them time, like you're giving them time to focus on something. I find that when I'm really active in a, in a class, when I as the teacher am doing a lot, my students are not doing as much. 
<laughs> and so like when there's when the classroom smells like hot glue and when there's like styrofoam crud on the carpet and when they when there's a music playlist going their hands and their minds are super active and I am not doing as much I am I got in the habit of like putting my hands behind my back so that I would stop trying to fix things and I would and walking around like this during my PD of like oh cool and like not like oh you could do the mm -mm. tell me what you're doing Tell me what you're struggling with. Like I, and now, like I, my students used to make fun of me. Be like, Miss Miss Derringer, well, it was Miss Wagaman at the time. Miss Wagaman's doing her walk, and it's like it's for your benefit. This is for you. <laughs> but like, what you're saying is that they were really they're they're just engaged in making, and that they're spending time working on something, mm -hmm. and so that they get a lot of joy in a little bit less like structure. But do you find that they actually stay on task pretty well with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're chatting, but they're they're working the whole time, and they're iterating not only the code but the the robot itself. Okay, yeah, not they're they're messing with the code, but they're also messing with the the build as well. Yeah, the build exactly. Yeah. Did we have something coming in on on Facebook, Matt? No, I'm just feeling chatty today, so I oh. wanted to comment on that. Talk about it. Talk and about it, Matt the robot. Oh, I also just I also wanted to say that. Um, you know, that's great that they're engaged in the mechanical part of it, right? So this is building the mechanisms. And uh, while decoration is certainly, and design is certainly a big part of what Hummingbird offers, um, the mechanical function of that robot is, is something that is, uh, that is critical and is kind of unique to, to the Hummingbird Robotics Kit. So I'm glad that that is where your kids are finding joy. Mm -hmm. and, and how, like... How cool is it that they're finding joy in like engineering? Like that, I guess maybe, maybe I grew up in an old fashioned part of the whatever, but like I just, I thought engineering was hard. And I thought that hard meant not fun. And actually, there's a, a teacher out in California, his name is Bob Kahn. And he, I was out in LA teaching a workshop, and Bob Kahn was in my, uh, in my workshop, and he introduced me to the word funstration which is like when you're frustrated because it's not working, but you've got about three more ideas to try and you're in it. Like it's not working, but you're in it and you're, you're there for it and you're, you're, you're struggling, but you're having fun. And that's a word that he got from a student, which I love that it, it came out of the mouth of a kid, right? That, that funstration is like absolutely something that I hope we all get to experience and that I think a lot of times kids don't. They just get to do frustration or fun. And, and that there's actually a marriage in between those. And so that they can sometimes be focusing on the code and be struggling through something on the code and be like, you know what, I'm going to take a minute, mess with this friendship bracelet string and really try to get this thing working, get this mechanism working like I need it to. And maybe that'll inspire me. Oh, I actually don't need it to move quite as far. It can do, you know, it could move less and do this, right? Um, what else? How, do, how else do, your, do you find your students experiencing joy? Yeah, David. Yeah, I usually give them uh, just essentially very, very minimal kind of directions. For example, I might, <clears throat> I might say that they have to create something that has two lights and two motions in it. And that's usually one of our first activities that we go through, just two and two. And they said, well, what else can we do with it? And I said, well, a lot of that is dependent on, on how you want to make it work. And some do just the very bare minimum, as, mo as, as there are some students and some people who will do just that. And then there are others that build things such as Ferris wheels, and they ask them how much time that they spent on it. And they said, well, we worked until 3 a.m. Friday night, and then we got up and worked on it from 9 a.m. <laughs> until 2 p.m. Saturday night, and then we worked on it all day Sunday. And okay, you know, but the directions were two and two. Yeah. And said, yeah, but we couldn't leave it at just that. Right. But we couldn't just we couldn't just let it be that, right? That's right. actually giving giving really minimal directions is something I am such a huge fan of that you don't actually have to solve your students' problems. Right. That you don't have to think of a you don't have to think of an activity that will be so that will not present any problems to them. Um, what I like to do when I present um, things is I, I like to give uh, my learners because uh, often my learners are teachers I give them criteria things that your project has to do and constraints things that it can't do so this is from a, a box puppet activity that we did didn't have anything to do with coding at all actually um, this is the criteria I was trying to find the criteria and constraints for the robot petting zoo I can only find the 
criteria and the title. <laughs> but there are constraints that go with this as well <laughs> for the robot petting zoo. There's actually a great little video series where I, I present that. Um, that video series is um, on the Robotics yeah. at Home page. Um, and so we have these um, uh, video series here for projects. So like the robot petting zoo is here. Um, so these are quick little videos. There's me. Hello there. Oop. We only need Not one because of these wasn't. But <laughs> the, these, these are, are I think, um, I'm biased, but I think they're great to, to go through um, to learn how to teach a project like the robot petting zoo. And I heard somebody as well. I didn't see who was talking, but go ahead. Was that Sam? Kelsey, yeah. I, did I interrupt? I'm sorry. No, I no. Could have been you, and that was a classic remote learning mistake. <laughs> um, so sorry. I, I was listening to what you were sharing about um, constraints and um, and and criteria, and I guess since I've interrupted you, I might I, I have to now say one thing that's hopefully helpful. And you do. You have to. <laughs> or if that's okay, um, I'm, I guess do. I'm already doing it. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I found um, that I, I had to remind myself not to like, if, if I'm going to all this, ex, you know, great efforts to try to solve every student problem before we even do the project, then who's really doing the learning or who's really doing the problem solving, you know? Um, so I have to fight that tendency within myself is to try to, um, I think it's important to still try to think about like, you know, things that areas where students could get stuck and how you're going to support them. But, but uh, yeah, we, if, um, I've, I've had to grow in that area and, and recognize that, you know, like you're saying, keep it simple, have, have criteria, have constraints and ways for them to expand. Um, and, and, but, but also know that, you know, it's not your, it's not your, uh, uh, responsibility to do everything for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think we, we want to always increase our students level of tolerance for struggle, but also that requires that we increase our tolerance for watching our students struggle, which, which was certainly hard for me to do when I was first teaching. I, 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 I was like, oh no, they're having a hard time. What a terrible thing. <laughs> oh no, right? But like, that's good. You want them to have good struggle, not bad struggle, right? Technical issues is not what you want them to be struggling through, but like, what, how are you going to bring your design into being? That's a great struggle to get through. Yeah, Eileen. Um, I'd like to say that um, I see the opposite end where I am sort of the slacker robotics with a really good programming teacher. Um, <laughs> you guys know, as soon as I got my hummingbird kit, I had accidentally thrown away what I thought was fillers, which were actually tools <laughs> for the bird brain robotics kit. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the screwdrivers and wire strippers. Yeah. So I told my students this and they're like, Miss Malik, you're not a builder. I'm, so I'll go around the room. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not a builder. So do this for me. And they're like, we're having problems. I'm like, why are you asking me? Someone fix this kid's robot. Okay. <laughs> So I dropped off a whole bunch of hummingbird kits to my students at their houses because they said they would build for me because I have no building skills. That's why my panic question came up because I gave it to one student. He was like, are you sure you want to do this, Mrs. Malik? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I hear you. And, and I really, I think too, just like empowering our students to prove us wrong is uh, easy for some teachers, difficult for some. Um, and uh, Nick was just saying in the chat, he said, I have real difficulty in not giving instructions as an engineer. I'm used to writing very unambiguous specifications or procedures intended to minimize failure. And like, that's super important to be able to do well, to like get your students onto the technology and um, get your students so that they, they know how to blink an LED. You need really clear instructions for things like that. But then once they know how to do that, when they're solving a, like, a design or an engineering challenge, like I think the, the, the greatest like mind flip that I had was just like, I'm, I put myself as more of a coach. Like I'm not, I'm not on the field. They gotta be the ones on the field. I'm just like, teaching them the skills so that when they get out there, they can play, which I'm like full of sports metaphors today, which is wild to me because I know nothing about sports. So if that wasn't a good one, sorry. Um, <laughs> and David, you wanna, you'll be our last comment while we're streaming. I'm going to have you um, give your comments and then I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to tell people how they can learn more about us. So um, go for it, David. Yeah, there are a couple of teachers around in different school districts in Western Pennsylvania 
to follow a strategy that says, look, if you want, it, it, when they, we're working on this or anything else, that if you have a question, you need to ask two other students first in order before you come to see me, the teacher. Yeah. And I struggled with that for, for a while, but I can, I can certainly understand how that works. And it talks about building a community of learners. And so when I thought about it in that perspective, I'm okay with it. Yeah, Alicia uh, is, is quoting what I'm sure a bunch of teachers are in their head. Do you want to say it out loud, Alicia? What's up? What is it? Oh, you're muted. Uh, the, the ask three before me. Uh, yeah. the, yep. ask three. That old three before me uh, adage is uh, um, pretty great. Um, a, a lot of teachers will do that. And I'll share one other um, tip that I've gotten from educators in the past um, of how they, they deal with this as well, which is that um, uh, Katie Henry uh, used to work at Bird Brain and um, is a, was a brilliant fourth grade teacher and STEM teacher before she came to Bird Brain. And um, she used to do a help desk that her students entirely managed, which was a series of sticky notes. So she would, at the front of her classroom on the whiteboard, she'd write help desk on there. And if a student asked three other students before her and still didn't know the answer, if she wasn't available, they would write out their um, question on a sticky note and they'd go stick it up there so that the students who finished the project sooner, when they would start like poking each other, because that's what fourth graders do when they finish their work, she'd be like, you know, uh, Tyrone. Have you checked the help desk? Oh, no. I'll do that, Miss Henry. Okay. So he'd go up and be like, okay, so Alicia says that she can't get her light to turn on. All right. And so he'd go, and they'd sit down. And they were, I mean, like, it takes a little while to facilitate that and get that to really work and get them to know what those expectations are, behavior expectations, how to help somebody through a problem. But what amazing things for them to be starting to do as fourth graders, you know? Um, so uh, uh, that's, like, that's like wizard level three before me is like three before me, and just have your students run their own help desk when they're 10. So, um, but uh, let me um, uh, uh, let people know how they can learn more about Bird Brain and learn more about the stuff that we're up to. So, as always, you can follow us on our different social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Absolutely, you should follow at Bird Brain Tech, and you can search for the hashtag Hummingbird Kit. There are so many teachers doing such cool things out in the world with Hummingbird, even from home, and we love to elevate what teachers are doing. So make sure to tag us in your posts with Hummingbird as well. Um, if you haven't yet, I referenced this a couple times during our webinar, but you should check out the Bird Brain Technologies website. You can go to just the basic website and find that Get Started page, um, find all of the resources for learning to program, or you can add slash robotics at home for all of our upcoming live webinars. Next week, we are going to be doing a, a series of really cool live webinars, and we're going to be co-hosting them with an organization called Catalyst Connections. They are an industry group that helps connect um, industry jobs to educators so that educators know what what you know manufacturing um, places are looking for in the future of work so that we can be doing that in schools as well because like manufacturing isn't your grandpa's assembly line job anymore it's a totally different industry involves a lot of computer science and robotics so I'm really excited to be joined by Scott Dietz who's going to be on both of our webinars next week as we talk about smart homes and the internet of things um, and you can find all of our live, live classes. You can find courses that will teach you how to use your hummingbird at home. And you can find those cool projects like Robot Petting Zoo. Um, you can find some video series about that as well. If you have any questions about anything, you can always email us, info at birdbraintechnologies.com, whether that's, hey, I'm doing a summer camp. Can you guys give me some special pricing for bulk ordering hummingbirds so that my kids can have hummingbirds at home and I can do this virtual camp? Totally. Uh, can you help me promote my summer camp? Yeah, we have a page for that. In fact, you can find cool robotics uh, and hummingbird summer camps on this robotics at home page. Check that out. Um, but also, like, uh, how could I get this for my district? If you have questions about professional development for your district, whether virtual, in person, etc., all of those resources you can ask us about by sending us an email. So, I want to give a huge thank you to the teachers who were able to join me on our Zoom meeting today. And if we can go to gallery view real quick, if you guys want to wave, uh, see you later. We are going to end our stream right here, but you guys can feel free to stay on the Zoom call if you have any other questions. So, thank you all so much for your expertise and the discussion today. And we will see y'all next week. Bye.
Thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see what you make on social media. On Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, you can tag at birdbraintech or hashtag hummingbirdkit, or you can even tag me. If you have any questions, be sure to email us, info at birdbraintechnologies.com. We can answer questions about purchasing, about learning, about teaching, and about professional development. If you haven't been there yet, be sure to visit our Robotics at Home page. There, you can purchase a kit for yourself, learn how to use it, and even join one of our upcoming webinars. Until we see you in class, thanks for watching from everyone at BirdBrain Technologies.